Good morning and welcome to Johnson Space Center and a special Facebook Live event. I'm Brandi Dean from the Public Affairs Office and joining me today we have Kirk Shireman, the Program Manager of the Space Station Program. Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm excited to be part of this event. Well, we have an exciting event. We're going to be talking soon with uh, astronauts Joe Acaba and Paolo Nespoli. Um, and they are going to be helping us kick off the year of education on the space station. As you may know, Joe is a former teacher who taught in middle school uh, in, and uh, math and science in Florida for several years before coming to NASA. And then later this year, one of his astronaut classmates, Ricky Arnold, will uh, also be going to the International Space Station. He also has uh, quite a bit of extensive uh, classroom experience. So in recognition of their... Uh, special background as educators this school year, NASA and the crews aboard the space station are going to be using that special platform of the station to really uh, push hard to inspire teachers and students here on the ground. Kirk, maybe you can tell us a little bit about why th that seemed like a good idea for the space station program. Sure. Well, we had a unique opportunity uh, this year to, uh, to expand the U.S. Uh, crew members uh, from three to four. And uh, and then in the uh, in the selection of the crew members to go fly those, we we ended up with uh, with Joe Acaba and Ricky Arnold, and of course uh, I would say it was not chosen that way, but 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 since they were both had an educational background, uh, both educators, uh, it just seemed like a great fit. What a what a great opportunity for us to go put a, a renewed and a, perhaps a much larger emphasis on education on board the International Space Station. So it really was a, 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 a unique opportunity and unique crew members said, hey, let's go do this. So uh, I'm really excited about the opportunity this year and, and I really hope that we'll take full advantage and, and have the chance to touch many, many kids and, uh, and educators across the nation. Absolutely. I think the way we're going to be doing that, or a few of the ways we're going to be doing that, is um, giving some extra time to the crews to talk with students here on the ground, maybe even doubling uh, what we normally do, and then also asking them to do some special uh, demonstrations that we're calling STEMonstrations for uh, STEM, the uh, science, technology, education, uh, engineering, and mathematics, um, giving them the chance to show what some of the science experiments that we might want to do here on the ground look like in space. Sure. We, you know, ISS is a fantastic laboratory. It's a laboratory like, like no other. Uh, and n number one, and of course, we have national labs across the United States that do very unique things. But, but this one in particular does things that are so out of the ordinary for all of us. It's just the, the kid in all of us, I think, comes out when you get to see what goes on the International Space Station. So we grab people's attention because it's in space, and then we can use that to really touch and inspire people to go uh, work on their education. So I think we have a really unique opportunity with this National Laboratory and, and with these educators this year. So we'll, uh, we'll see how it goes. I think that's got to be one of the, <coughs> the best opportunities that we have to inspire students. I know Mm -hmm. I would have been amazed to have an opportunity like this when I was in school. Absolutely. You know, of course, when I was in school, uh, we didn't have people living and working in space. Uh, but, but today, uh, we've, had, we've had people living and working in space for, uh, for 16 years, uh, coming up on, actually coming up on 17 years. And so uh, there's, there's people who are seniors in high school who've never known a time when humans weren't living and working in space. And we want to we wanna make sure that people know about that and are inspired by that. So this is, again, it's a great opportunity. Um, and, and we have the ability, we have the people who have those skills on board, and, uh, and we're going to take advantage of it. And how long have you been with NASA, Kurt? I've been with NASA since 1985, May 20th, 1985. So, so you've seen a lot of changes over the years, and I'm sure the station's involved, evolved a lot under, under your leadership as well. Um, anything that you think that would truly amaze students that you're hoping they'll get out of this? Uh, you know, I, the, the thing that's always amazing to me, anyway, is the, the you think things work a certain way, and it turns out that they don't. And so uh, and space is a great opportunity to see it. Certainly you can see very quickly that, that they work differently um, up there than they do here. But even the ones that you can imagine how they work, and it turns out that they don't work that way, that's, that's the really cool thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I hope that we'll see that. And then the next question is, well, why does it work differently than I expected? And that's where it really ties into education. What is the physics behind what's going on? And how does that physics or that knowledge of the physics then allow, apply to, to problems, whether they're in space or on the ground, and allow us to build a, a better world for all of us? All right. Well, we should be hearing from um, the Capcom commit calling up to the crew on board the station to start us off in just a second now. So we'll, hold, we'll stand by for that. Station.
Houston, are you ready for the event? Houston, this is station. We are ready for the event. JSC PAO, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. This is Brandy Dean from Johnson Space Center Public Affairs Office. How do you hear me? And this is the International Space Station. We have you loud and clear. Great. It is fantastic to be talking to you. Thank you so much for joining this morning. And uh, just so you know, I'm also here with Kirk Shireman. So we're both excited to be kicking off the year of education in space with you guys. We have a lot of people on Facebook Live getting ready to send us in some questions, and we'll be taking those uh, and sending them up to you. Um, but first, I thought I'd give uh, Kirk a chance to say hi. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, it's great to see you on board the ISS today. How are you guys doing? How you doing, Kirk? We are doing great. Uh, it's, uh, you know, really an honor and a privilege to be up here working on the space station. We're getting a lot of science done, and, uh, yeah, we're having a great time. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you for being part of this. You know, Joe uh, and Paolo, part of the, the emphasis this year on education is really because we have the expanded USOS crew um, and, uh, and certainly because of your skills and, and uh, your unique uh, skills and that fantastic laboratory that you have up there. So uh, we're really excited about the opportunity this year and uh, thank you for being part of that. Yes, Kirk, uh, as you know, because you, you manage it, uh, this laboratory is an incredible uh, place outside the Earth for the Earth. And here we can do a lot of science, a lot of technology, but a lot of education. And it's very good that uh, uh, we start this year in space. Okay, well, we will jump right into the questions. We've got one uh, that's appropriate for the year of education kickoff. It's coming from pre-service teachers and faculty at the University of Houston downtown. And they want to know, um, as teachers and scientists, how can classroom teachers help their students get a better understanding of the nature of science and to do real science in the classroom? Well, that's pretty cool. We're working with the, uh, the pre-service teachers, especially having those that are uh, close to home there in Houston. And, you know, I think one of the most important things that we can do as educators when we're in the classroom is to try to make things uh, important to the students but also tangible and so I'm hoping that the work we can do together will be these pre-service teachers coming up with great ideas of things they might want to use to inspire their students coming up with those ideas sharing those with us and then letting us help you uh, back in the classroom uh, we have this here where we have some uh, candies inside of a little plastic kind of a globe and there's lots of amazing things that you can do with something as simple as this. So we're hoping that we can take advantage of the space station and your great ideas to help inspire those students. All right, well, we've got some questions coming in from students as well. Uh, this one's from uh, Jamil Kareem, and they want to know how frequently you observe auroras and are they detectable in sunlight? Well, uh, auroras are very interesting. Uh, this is my second long-duration mission, and in the previous mission, I was up here for about six months. I think I saw twi two auroras, just a little bit faint in the horizon. But this mission here is just incredible. We had some incredible auroras lighting up the whole sky, sky at night. So from my point of view, they're a little bit uh, unpredictable. In fact, they are a direct function of the activity of the sun and what happened between the interaction of the sun and the magnetic earth at the magnetic uh, field of the Earth. And uh, we saw them, we saw many, many, many of them. And even today, a little bit fainter, if we go outside in the evening, almost every night we can see some of them. And have y'all seen auroras from the ground? If so, which, which do you recommend, which view? So, you know, I'm a kid from SoCal, and so we don't get too many auroras down there, so it is, um, you know, one of my goals is to go somewhere where I can see it, but one uh, pretty neat story is we were going to, uh, to Kazakhstan to pick up a crew member, and while we were flying, we could actually see the auroras, so that was pretty neat. So I haven't seen it while I'm on Earth. I've seen it in a plane, and I've seen it from here, so one of my goals. How about you? 
Yeah, I would say that I saw one uh, in uh, Sweden. Uh, uh, I had the, the occasion to be there, and uh, and and it was very peaceful to me watching this aurora from the Earth up here in space. To me, it's a completely different feeling. We are spinning so fast, and the aurora is moving so fast. It changes completely, and it gives me a sense of of something that is really active, and and a little bit less peaceful, to be to be honest. But spectacular, for sure. I can only imagine. Well, one, of the, one of the things I think is interesting in, uh, in that is, uh, in the past, I know some of uh, your crewmates have taken videos of this, and they put it to music. And that's one of the things I, I find fascinating is, is it's really, a, as you pointed out, Paolo, it's a, a phenomena uh, caused by the sun, which you have to see in the darkness. And yet, people see art in that uh, in that form as well. So it really kind of ties everything together. Absolutely, Kirk. It's uh, it's they are incredible. The colors, the shape, the forms, the way they go around the Earth, the way they spike up from Earth. It's absolutely incredible. We took uh, uh, time lapses, so we put a camera on uh, on a window, and then we let it take uh, a picture every second, and we can combine in this way thousand pictures and in a, in a minute or in a couple of minutes show what uh, the camera captures in, in about 15 minutes. And it's absolutely astonishing. It's beautiful. And if I can just uh, add one more thing from this conversation is that for those teachers that are out there and those students that are out there, you know, we talk about art and a lot of times we think art is separate from the sciences and really they're not. So. For those people that you know feel like they're more on the artistic side, you know, don't be afraid of the sciences because it is an art, and so it's neat when you can bring those two things together. Um, I don't know that it would quite count as art, but it looks like y'all did uh, an experiment recently that I think is going to capture a lot of school student attention. Uh, you sent down some some video maybe over the weekend, uh, but we've got a question about how does a fidget spinner work in space? So that that may be inspired by the video you sent down. So great question, and I'm glad we just uh, we picked one up, and uh, a video just went out on Friday, so you can uh, see the space spinner that is out there. And what's really neat, is, of course, is we're in this microgravity environment. You can get a really cool spin going, and you can release it. So you can see it'll pretty much stay there. Um, and then if Paolo imparts any little bit of force on it, it will follow the vector of the force that he's put on that. So you can do all kinds of things. And this is just a good example of what the teachers can ask us to do to help explain some of the concepts that they're going to teach in the classroom. And the, uh, the little spinner, it's fun, and uh, we have a good time with it. And if you haven't seen the video yet, it's pretty fun. Uh, well, kind of uh, reversing it a little bit, we have a teacher, Joe, that wants to know what things you learned as a teacher that prepared you for being aboard the space station. Well, I think uh, being a school teacher is, it's an awesome job, but it prepares you very well, maybe more than any other profession for being an astronaut. As all of you teachers know, you go and you start the day and you have a plan in place. You think you know what you're going to do every minute. Up here, we start the day and we have a plan in place, so it's very similar. But then as soon as those kids walk in the door and they do something or ask a question, there goes your plan. And so you have to be very flexible. You have to be able to think on your feet. And up here, it's the same way, where we think we have a plan. And if it doesn't go quite right, you have to learn how to fix it. You have to work as a team. And so, you know, being a teacher is, I think I can say it might be harder than this job because we have all of Mission Control helping us. And you teachers are in your classroom by yourselves. And now you've got to fix the problem. So I think being a teacher really prepared me for this job. Brendan, I'm a, I am an engineer, and I just look at Joe and I admire his patience because he has an enormous amount of patience with everything that happens and the capability of cope with almost anything. And that's, uh, I think that comes from the dealing every day with the situation with students, with people, that of course uh, each one of them pushes you in every direction, and if you're not flexible and patient, you're not going anywhere. 
Joe uh, and Paolo, it seems like one of the one of the traits too is to is to see to see some phenomena not through your own eyes but through the eyes of a student, and and then figure out how to uh, explain it so that they understand it from from their perspective. And, uh, and again, I think that ties into your, your life every day, right? The rest of the world is down here on the planet when you're doing an experiment, even with the, the principal investigator, you have to explain what it means from, from their perspective as opposed from, from your own. And uh, that's a, a really unique skill. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really interesting. Uh, you know, as a teacher, you know, I, I think I was a terrible math teacher for quite a few years because, you know, math came easy to me as a, you know, as a kid. I liked math and, you know, it was pretty easy. So I would, I taught the kids the way I learned and the way I thought was simple to learn and it didn't work well for everybody. So you really do have to look at who you're talking to and saying it five times over again doesn't make it any clearer. So we do have to find different ways to express um, what we're trying to say and how to get that uh, concept across. And that's one other thing about that too, it seems like, uh, uh, at least for me as a student, the applicability, in other words, what? so you're learning something, you're learning math or you're learning, for me it was, it was uh, algebra, uh, you know, what's the point, what, what are we doing this for? And, and, and again, I think the space station and you guys up there can really help say, hey, this, this is why you're learning it. This is why it's important. It really does be able to uh, describe the, uh, the motion of things or, uh, or the biological phenomena. All these things apply, and here's why. So it's really the application of the knowledge that you're gathering. Yeah, Kirk, that's exactly right. And that's why we want to get the teachers involved so they can tell us what they need and we are happy to, to help them do that. And being astronauts, we are, we are students. We spent years uh, in training to get up here. And it's funny that you say that where sometimes we're taught things and we want to step back and say, okay, now why do I need to know this? So even as adults, I think it's super important as we learn new things. All right, well, given the students a little bit of taste of what it's like in space, we have a few questions uh, on uh, kind of Space Flight 101. And uh, the Malanfi School wants to know what type of foods astronauts eat in space. Well, I wish uh, we would have a beautiful kitchen here where we can prepare all sorts of things I crave from a from a pizza, actually. Yes. I like to have a pizza. Kirk, can we have a pizza up here, please? <laughs> but, uh, but the truth is that it's very, very difficult to cook and to handle fluids, especially hot fluids, in, in this kind of environment. I would not say impossible, but very, very difficult. And, uh, and therefore, the food that we have is something that can be managed a little bit like the, the food that uh, we use in the, in the military, those uh, a meal ready to eat, food already prepared, or a TV, what is it called? A TV dinner, a TV dinner <laughs> something like that. So we have uh, thermostabilized food, food, we have uh, um, uh, radiatable food, we have irradiated uh, food, mostly meat, and, uh, and what else? Uh, what are Juices we and coffee, uh, but everything is contained in a bag. So it's uh, either you have to cut the bag open to get to it, sometimes you suck out of the bag, and it's, uh, it's a little bit different. We're looking forward to that pizza. It's a picnic for uh, six months, uh, essentially. Uh, but at, at the end, we have enough variety here, so each one of us can pick uh, his own uh, preferred food. And, uh, and it's actually pretty good, to tell you the truth. At the end, uh, I thought it would be worse, but it's actually not bad. And I would say tortillas are our friends up here. We don't have a lot of bread because of the crumbs that they, uh, they create. But you'd be surprised at what you can put on a tortilla, so try that at home. You've been playing with your food a little bit. If the, uh, I think the, the ball of candy in the background is any indication. Yeah, we're astronauts and we're professionals, but we're big kids as well, and we like to have fun. Speaking of fun. Um, and we play with food sometimes, so. Yeah, fun. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Spe speaking of fun, um, Hillary, uh, or her sixth grade students want to know how gravity works differently in space. So maybe you can give us a demonstration. Well, uh, 
there is gravity here in space, but because we are falling, falling down towards the Earth, and nothing is stopping us, so the spacecraft is falling, we are falling, I am falling, everybody is falling, uh, the result is that essentially you don't feel the effect of gravity. And, uh, and you can do a lot of things. It's, it's actually incredible what happens when you go up here in space, because you come up here like a terrestrial person, so with gravity in your mind, and you start trying to walk but how can you walk in these conditions so so you you have to to learn to walk with your hands and then when you go somewhere and you want to stay stable you cannot use your hands because otherwise you cannot work so you have to use your feet and uh, and so it's kind of strange you walk with your hands and stay still with your feet and not only that you tend to walk uh, with your feet towards what we call the floor, but there is no floor and you have to learn to move and to adapt and put yourself in a way that you can actually work effectively, efficiently. So you have to become Spider-Man, Superman. You have to become an extraterrestrial person and it's actually fun. It's one of the discovery of space. It takes few weeks, I have to say, but once you manage this, it's absolutely incredible. Yeah, Paolo, one of the things I find really interesting, too, uh, and just watching you guys here in this this event is, uh, you know, this uh, the, uh, one of Newton's laws, when you put something in, a body in motion will tend to stay in motion. And, uh, you know, we know that from school, but you guys, even just holding that microphone and trying to leave the microphone sitting in one place, you know, any little tiny motion you leave on that microphone before you let go, it stays and just drifts off, uh, drifts off and uh, like the globe a minute ago drifted off into another module. So uh, all these really fundamental laws of physics you guys uh, live and breathe every day. Yeah, and there are uh, unintended consequences because you learn very quickly that you just push yourself and you're going where you want to go. The fact that you forget that you have to stop. And so <laughs> at the beginning, you don't realize that. And when you hit the wall uh, pretty fast and you start hurting yourself, you figure out that ah, Newton laws, it's very important here. You better pay attention to it. All right, uh, we're getting close to the end of our time, but uh, one other question that did come in that we wanted to ask is uh, anything you can tell us about your favorite teachers and subjects when you were in school? Well, I, um, you know, I did like the sciences, uh, so that was always fun, uh, chemistry, physics, but my favorite class was actually my metal shop class in high school and so we could take electives and so I actually took four years of metal shop where we learned how to weld, uh, work on a lathe, we were uh, making molds, we were, you know, just you name it, we got to do it. And to do that as a high school student, it was great. It prepared me for the, dif the different jobs that I've had. And as a teacher, I reflect back on that and I wonder how Mr. Walters handled 30 high school kids with high powered tools, with you know welding flames and things like that and you know he gave us a lot of responsibility as students and we loved that and we ran with it so it was a it was great as a student and as a teacher it was really neat to see to look back and see how he managed the classroom and do you think uh, you had any teachers that would have made good astronauts I think uh, Mr. Walters would have been a great astronaut. When you look at what we do up here every day, you know, a lot of it is doing repairs. And it takes someone who can, you know, who can work with their hands, who can understand a problem and find a way to, to fix it. But he might have been too good where he might have redone the whole space station. So it's probably better that we kept him on Earth. Good advice. <laughs> well, last thing, any, uh, anything you want to say or any advice you have for the students who'd be watching right now? Well, if, uh, if you're watching, we want to thank you for coming on board, and we hope that we can share our experience and, and show you how science is real, how science is fun. And I would just tell any student out there, you know, find that subject, those subjects that you really love, and run with them, whether it's science or not. You know, all of us that are up here, we have different backgrounds, but we all really enjoyed our careers before we got here. And when you find something that you love, it's, 
it's more enjoyable to do. It doesn't actually seem like work. Um, get you get paid. Um, and, you know, you may not always be the smartest person out there, like someone has told me many times, but you can always be the one that works the hardest. So don't be afraid to work hard and try new things. I would, uh, I would tell kids that, uh, you know, math, science, uh, research, these are not things for crazy people. Well, some of the people are crazy, but, but not people out of the world. We are not, you know, s Nobel Prize winner or, or geniuses or anything. We are just regular people that, that have had the strength to, to have a dream and pursue it and eventually be up here. And if I made it, if Joe made it, it means it's possible. Everybody can do it. So just, just have a dream and wake up after you had a dream and just go at it because you can actually do it. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing your dream with us. We look forward to seeing a lot more as we go through this great year of education on the station. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, guys. We appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications. It's, it's without borders. And certainly what we're trying to do on the International Space Station is, is like that. While we were talking to these guys, they actually orbited about one third of the planet. So, uh, so uh, anyway, it's just amazing to me that, uh, that they're seeing a third of the planet in these few minutes that we were, uh, we were talking to them and, and they can impact a third of the planet or more. Absolutely. Yeah, it's amazing and amazing that they are able to take some time out for this knowing what all, they, what all, what all else they've got going on. Sure. I know yeah. uh, Joe's getting ready for a space walk. So. That's right. Friday we're going to go outside and, uh, and uh, do some more work outside. It'll be the third of our, uh, of our space walks, uh, the last one really that we have planned until, uh, until next year. Mm -hmm. So we're looking forward to, uh, to, to Joe Acaba and, uh, and Randy Bresnick going outside uh, on Friday. And I know you've also probably got a lot of work to get back to, but uh, one more question for you. Um, sure. These guys get asked all the time, you know, how they became an astronaut, but how, how did you become a space station program manager? Was that something that you had any idea about when you were young? Yes, uh, absolutely not. Of course, when <laughs> I was a kid, I was born, I was born in 1962. So uh, people were flying in space by then. Uh, as a little kid, I got to see uh, the first steps on the, on the moon, which was really exciting. Although... Uh, you know, it wasn't that that said, hey, I need to go work for NASA. I, my, in my case, I was fascinated by airplanes. I loved airplanes from a small, as a small child. Even, I can remember five years old building little balsa wood airplanes, and I wanted to build and fly airplanes. That's what I wanted to do. And so I went to school to be an engineer so I could build and fly airplanes. And I had the opportunity to go work on the space shuttle. And so, you know, what better airplane than one that flies in space and on the ground? And then from the space shuttle, I, I came to the space station. So it just one thing led to another. But it's just been this, I would say, lifelong interest in flying and in, in machines that, uh, that took humans faster and higher than they've ever gone before. Uh, it was my passion. It was my interest. And I'm, I'm like, uh, like Joe and Paolo said, I guess it was really Paolo said, hey, just find something that you're passionate about and, and, uh, and wake up every day and pursue that passion. Yes. And, and really anything is possible. Yeah, it's, it's clear just watching you and watching these guys. Yeah. All right, well, we are going to wrap up now. But of course, you're going to want to keep up um, as, the, we go out, as we go on with this year of education on station. A few ways that you can do that is by following us on Facebook. You can look for NASA JSC Education. And then on Twitter, um, right now, with the, with the crew we've got on board, several of them are on uh, Twitter. You can look for them at Astro Acaba, and that's Joe Acaba's account, or Astro underscore Paolo for Paolo Nespoli, um, and Astro underscore Ricky, who will be coming up to join, with, join the space station crew uh, next year. And again, with the spacewalk coming up, you're going to want to tune back into NASA TV for that. We'll be uh, uh, beginning that spacewalk probably around 8.05 a.m. Eastern time on Friday. Uh, and you can watch that live on nasatv.gov live. And 
As always, you can keep up with what's going on at the space station at nasa.gov station. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.